Okay. Welcome, Thursday, June 3rd, class session. This is Math 264, Introduction to Ordinary Differential Equations, Delta College, Spring 2021. So what's on our plate today? Remember, Thursday is our practice and review session. So I've thought about some problems that I thought were interesting or useful to you. But the number one thing I've seen in examples and questions over the last 24, 48 hours is just you need a little more help working out how to do the technology. And, and not all technology is equal, but all of them are equally challenging. So I need to probably do a more careful Excel example with you and a more careful Mathematica example. Now, we'll talk about exam one in a second up here, but I want you to think about this technology here is not an extra thing or extra pictures that you add to decorate your homework. I mean, it's literally, it's literally what you're learning. So you can't do these things without some kind of technology. And you can't do these things without learning the technology. And I know you've probably got all kinds of limitations based on time and work and equipment. I can respect that. Uh, theoretically, you could run Mathematic in a browser if you paid $9 a month for a student subscription. If you're in that place, that your equipment is not good enough to run it on the computer. I've run Mathematica in a browser on a Chromebook using the subscription service called Mathematica Online. And again, student price for that would be $9 a month. But let's not talk about pricing. You need to consume, create, produce these notebooks. And there's a heavy learning curve with the errors and the syntax and things like that. But there's only one way to do it. It's the same way you do the solutions you send to me. You send me the solutions. I mark down what's right and what's wrong and give you some tips. You get to do the same thing with your Excel worksheets and with your Mathematica notebooks. If you've got a problem with a Mathematica notebook, save it, close it, email it to me, and we'll fix it. And just like if you were learning to do the quadratic formula, you forget the plus minus, and then I write on your homework, you forgot the plus minus, and then you don't forget the plus minus ever again. So you will get the speed very, very quickly, but you have to let me see and correct your issues. And everybody has some issues to one degree or another right now with these. But do not send, I mean this in a friendly and helpful way. Do not send me the email that says I couldn't get it to work. Send me the email with a notebook attached so I can help you get it to work. Okay? So that's, I think, what we're going to primarily look at here. Maybe five alt and maybe a mathematic example here in three or 15, something where I do that stuff from scratch. You do have a kind of a head start with the Mathematica and Excel both is that I posted sheets that you can use, but as you modify them, yes, I know you must be introducing possibly some syntax errors. So don't be afraid to modify them, but when you modify them and you get errors, then you gotta come back to me, okay? So that's the first speech today. Now, before we go and do some of these, let's just make sure we're all on the same page with the exam and the instructions. And this is gonna be some legal garbage, but this is what's required. So let me share a browser with you and let's go visit our website. Zoom, zoom, zoom. Uh, Microsoft Edge. I'm a kind of an Apple-y person, but Microsoft Edge is not bad. It's always good to have some independent browser on your machine so that you can look at things in a different way. 
Okay, we're at the website. Semesters, six, four. Week two. I'll put an announcement about the exam being posted here too when it's posted. But right here, week two, our page, you know it assessments, this is where the exam is going to be released. So here's the link to exam one, instructions, solutions. Right now the instructions link is turned on and the other two links are not turned on. Okay, because they're not even posted. But let's look at the instructions together. Not because I'm trying to be legalistic or rule making, but I have a particular reason for what I wrote as I wrote it. So let me see if I can pull this up. This is going directly to Google Drive. I could open this. You know, this is going external to Google Drive. I could open this on my own notebook if I'm having lag issues here. But it's always better to demonstrate it as you would actually see it. Here we go. And I gotta see how size looks like on your monitor and my monitor. Okay, sorry. Try it again. So I don't know what your pandemic testing experience has been, but mine has been interesting. And the rules that I'm making here are really rather related to protect you and to work with other institutions. And I'll explain that as we read. So this is the rules for this test. There's six problems on this test and you have to submit it to me as a single PDF document, just like you do with your homework, including this instruction page with your signature by 11.59 on Monday, June 7. It'll be released tonight by 11.59. I release it as you're handing in the homework. And the idea is I let's get one thing off the table before we release another thing. So here's your PDF document. It should be neatly organized and it may include multiple pages. Number your pages, write your name on each page. That just helps me keep things straight. I think you guys are doing a good job of handing in the homework so far, but if there's one thing I can say, it's don't just assemble a lot of files into a PDF. I mean, you are preparing a document, you are writing a report. So as best as you can, you might have multiple image files, but sometimes they're coming across to me as large, small, sideways, up and down. So put them in a document, make it a presentation, make it organized. That'll actually help you preparing your answers, okay? I can always work out the name from the file as it arrives on my system. But if you have your name on each page, it just helps me not, it helps me know where one person's test ends and the other person's test begins. Because basically I import these into an iPad and I just grade them on the iPad. At the beginning of the pandemic, I was printing things out and that just basically destroyed my printer and cost lots of ink. Okay, show me all the work necessary you need to reach your answers. Indicate each answer clearly. Don't approximate something unless they ask for it. That's pretty standard. Uh, here's the pandemic rules. You have to complete this exam entirely by yourself. This is different from the homework. I don't mind if you're working together on homework issues and I actively help you with homework. But this exam is entirely your own and you cannot consult with other people or other websites. You can use your own book and notes. You can use any material on our website, any of our spreadsheets or Mathematica notebooks. You don't have to do everything from scratch, but it has to be your work prepared by you. You can use a calculator, computer algebra system, Mathematica, whatever Desmos, whatever works for making your graphs or checking your work is okay with me. But when you present an image, 
present it nicely in a standard paper, eight and a half by 11 portrait orientation. So just as if it was a piece of paper that you were handing in at someone's desk. And you guys are at the place, and I know it because I see students years before you and years after you in school and in industry. You guys are at the place where you're in kind of getting into report mode. And there's no way when you go work for Microsoft, Google, Consumers, Energy, Ford, there's no way you're just gonna email a batch of files to your supervisor, right? I doubt you're gonna use paper either, but whatever you present, you gotta organize it. So you may not share any of the questions on this exam with anyone or any service. And yes, I know all the services. I literally wanna see your work because I want to make sure that I'm showing you how to do this work. You can't discuss any part of this exam with anyone else until it's graded and returned to you. But if you have a question about the exam, I have no problem answering the question. You're like, did you mean this? Or what did you mean by this? Yeah, those are questions I have to answer because if we were in a classroom, I would answer them. So absolutely get this exam tonight, take a nap in the afternoon, stay up, get the exam, at least read it to make sure you know what you're hoping for Go to sleep, let it kick around in your brain because it actually works. But email me if you have a question and not Monday at 10 p.m. Okay? I understand these instructions and I follow them. Your signature. Now, let me tell you why I'm being legalistic and it's not to be punitive. In this whole pandemic experience, I'm dealing with lots and lots of schools. And ordinarily in this class, I deal with a lot of people and a lot of schools, in-state, out-of-state, big uppity school, little ordinary school. I deal with a lot of schools over 25 years. And a lot of schools have different rules. And there are famous schools that say, we accept no classes, mathematics that are done online. Well, that school had to change its tune last March. But I still get inquiries from schools, the Michigans, the MSUs, the MTUs, and they say, oh, we want to review your course to make sure it's up to character. It's up to snuff. You know, they have to approve my course if you want to transfer it to their school. And in this pandemic experience, they add extra questions like, how did you do the testing? How did you make sure the student's work was their own? So these rules are not for you so much as, of course they're for you, but so much as they're part of the way I communicate with the other institutions. And I know other institutions have their rules and their procedures as well. But if a school comes back to me and says, how did you do this class? How did you set the rules for exams? I'm going to show them this paper and I'm going to show them your signature and I'm going to say to them, that is good enough for me. I cannot police you in any way. I know when things look weird and over 25 years, you've seen a lot of things look weird, but I am not policing you. I am reporting your grade to that other institution and saying to them, these are the parameters. They're the best I could do. Literally, you could not do better than you've reviewed and approved my course pre-pandemic. So I don't get mean, but you know, I say, you know, I expect you to approve and transfer this course in these circumstances. I, I do it with a lot more politeness than that. But that's the purpose of this introductions page, right? Okay, so I have a lot of faith 
and you guys individually. But in this environment, we got to do a lot of extra things to check the boxes, right? Okay. So let's back up. So those are the instructions. You include them with your test so that I have those on file, your signature on file. So tonight, this exam one link will be live and you do the test. Later, I'll make the solutions available just like I make the homework solutions available. So if you have any questions about the exam before or during, you certainly send them to me in an email and I'll answer you directly. I, you guys are doing a decent job of sending me emails. I think sometimes you could send me more because you kind of tend to wait too long because you're trying to honestly and completely do things by yourself. But in this situation, accelerated class, strange circumstances, sometimes I got to help you a little bit more. So here's, for example, a solution to a homework problem that you handed in last night. So like I post solutions to homework, I will post solutions to exams. Sometimes I type them, sometimes I write them. Okay, so then we've got the parameters set. So if, and I know I can't answer all questions here. If you have a question about the exam or procedure, toss it in the chat box or speak it out, no problem. Uh, I said six problems on the exam. They look similar to the problems I've given you for the homework so far. I try not to do six problems with six parts each. I, so I try to tone them down a little bit in length, but you know, it's, but I guess you would probably look at them and say, that's the same as the homework problem, Dave. Uh, why is the test different from a homework problem? Literally because in the homework problems, you are learning, I am helping you. You can help each other. I don't mind if you do more of that. But on the exam, I want you to, I want to see more of you in report mode, you in independent mode. I do not want you to spend time too much polishing the presentation. You don't have to make it super neat and tidy, ready to be published in the Journal of Algebra. But you do want to make it organized. And I want to see your thought processes. So you make sure you explain what you're doing. OK? And you guys are making decent progress explaining what you're doing. OK, if there's no other example, or no other question you want to post about that, let's go and do some problems. And specifically, let's go do Excel problem. And let's go do a Mathematica problem. One of these in Excel and one of these in Mathematica. So let me pull up five alt because you're looking at five alt right now at home, you're working on it, but maybe I should go a little ways down that road with you so you can see it actually being worked out partially and see the problems that you should expect to encounter. So let me pull up that problem. And here's the problem. And I pull up a, I'll pull up an Excel notebook that's kind of preset because I have Excel notebooks that are preset on my webpage. Here's just a random Excel notebook I was playing with a second ago. Let me open that up and let me see if I can position them and share screen. I don't think sharing the whole screen really worked out that well last time. But once in a while, Share screen should be okay. So 
So I'm, I'm almost doing this from scratch. And let me share a screen now. Make sure you see what I see. Okay, no, I don't want to share Excel workbook alone. I want to share the screen. Okay, do you see what I see? Yes. So here's the problem, the way you were handed the problem. Here's an Excel notebook where I've been doodling with the problem, but I think I'm going to have to do more. Let me pump this up. See if that's more readable. Well, you can always go full screen on your screens. That is decently readable for me on my sample monitor that represents you. If it's not readable, just ask me to make it larger. So the instructions and the problem, and then we can concentrate on the notebook or the Excel workbook. Euler's method, Excel spreadsheet, plot an approximation to this problem. And this problem was from 2.2, number 15 alt. So basically you handed in 2.2.15 alt yesterday, you were trying to do it with Mathematica. Now I say to you, but could you do it more bare bones from Excel? So let's crank out the sample solution in Excel. So system is dx dt is sine y, dy dt is 2x minus x cubed minus y. This is not going to have all the power of Mathematica, but if I just need a solution, Excel workbook is going to be fine. So I've got my notes here. Here's the equations, here's the equations, initial conditions. At time zero, I want to be at one and minus three. Uh, I want to do this for 10 seconds. So if I took, let me delete that line. If I took 10 steps of one second each, that would do it. In fact, why I'm here, why don't I delete all these lines? <laughs> Say that I'm truly doing this from scratch. That means delete all the lines, Dave. So I wanna count how many iterations I use. I wanna count the TKs, that's my watch. I'm keeping track of the time every second, every 10th of a second, whatever. I wanna count the position I'm at at every second or every time interval. Then I wanna use the two functions to represent the rate of change in the X direction and the rate of change in the Y direction. Then I want to talk about the elapsed time, change in X, change in Y. Okay, so let's start to fill it in. I'm going to start K equals zero at time zero uh, minus one, X is one, Y is minus three. I can use as many decimal places as I like, three or four is fine. That's all I can absorb as a human with my eye. Okay, what is F, the X slope? That's the sine Y. So here I write equals sine of Y value box. Uh, Excel does the trigonometric functions automatically in radians by default. So that is the right place. We're not making any radian degree mistakes. So that doesn't look bad to me. What's the G slope? A little more fancy. It is two times the X box minus the X box. Did I screw that up? Yep, that's what undo is for. Okay, two times the X box minus the X box again cubed minus the Y box. No fancy formulas, but I had to, no, no sine or cosine or anything. Elapsed time, let's set that to one second, as I said. Now dx is going to be, the change in x is going to be the rate of change in x times the dt. So these two boxes equals stop times stop. 
and the dy is going to be the rate of change in the y direction times the elapsed time stop. So got that times dt there and times dt there. Uh, I didn't screw that up, did I? No, that's right. And that's right. Yes. Now the next thing is I got to do the next line. I can't just pull down this line because this line has initial values in it, right? If I pull down this line, I don't iterate anything. So I got to set up the next line, the instructions for creating the next line. So I'm going to make the k equal to the one above plus one, the so one more counter. I'm going to make the t equal to the t above plus the change in t. Okay, that's going to add the dt automatically. I'm going to make the x box equal to the x box above plus the change in x. Got it. I'm going to make the y box equal to the y box above plus the change of y. This is very slow at the beginning because you're writing the rules. Now the formula is the same. So I could cut and paste this formula. Oh, I think I just screwed up. Yep, let's undo. I could copy that formula, go down here and paste. No, that just copies the value. Okay, let's pull down. See, that pulls down the formula. It used to be sine d8, now it's sine d9. Uh, I do not want to have that gray coloring, so let's undecorate that gray thing. Okay. Same thing here. I could just pull down this formula. So I don't have to rewrite it. Cut the fill. For dt, I want this to always be the same number, so I'll just make this equal to the box above it. So when I change this first box, everything changes. And then these two, I should be able to just pull down because they were straight formulas and I cut the fill. Now this whole second line is assembled by pull downs and assignments. So I can just pull this whole thing down and there's 10 steps. But now the fun begins. So I understand you may have done this already. It's still worthwhile to make sure everybody's on the same page. And you might learn a trick. So I take this as I did yesterday. I insert the scatter plot. Uh, it doesn't help me too much. Oh, I remember doing this yesterday. And when I did this yesterday, I had to redecorate this all from scratch. Okay, no problem. We'll do that. So to decorate this chart from scratch, what I'm going to do is check out the y-axis and set it from minus 4 to 4. Uh, major axes at 1, minor axes at 0 0.5. That's OK. Now I'm going to check out the x-axis. Let's run that from minus 4 to 4. 1 and 0.5. Got it. I do not want these axes to be in the middle. So that can put that axis at the other side. And if you use one of my pre-built ones, I've already done this for you. OK, so now I got the axes at the bottom. Uh, I'd like this to be kind of square. OK, I'm going along. So I'm going to stop the screen share and go just to the Excel sheet, sh scare, sheet share so that we can expand this picture a bit. Got it. OK, you're still with me. Got it. I'm going to expand this window so that I see more things at once. Got it. I think I want to join 
these points, of course. So let's say points, lines, solid lines. Good. I mean, it looks terrible, but I've joined the points. So now I've got a functioning machine and you say, well, looks terrible. Well, but it begins at one minus three. Maybe it looks terrible because my time correction is too great, 0 0.5. Okay, this could be that problem I saw the other day. Uh, do I want more lines? Let's go down to 20 lines. Now it didn't change this picture, right? Because what I got to do is drag these down. Someone knows how to drag both of them down at the same time, throw that in the chat window because somehow I know I should be able to do that. Okay, that doesn't help me too much. In fact, it really looks bad as far as the solution goes, right? Maybe my DT is still not excellent. That still doesn't look good. So I'm nervous that I screwed up something when I got these nine fours all the way across, right? Let's pull that down carefully again. I'm still having the same issue. Let's bend this down all the way. Wow, why am I getting that? And they wanted to go to 10 seconds. So obviously the way this is repeating there, something is going wrong. Let's go down to 10 seconds and then we'll see if we can fix it. This is why you never do things from scratch. <laughs> uh, but this is the same problems you're having. Now we see the problem. I didn't copy the rest of this column chart here. Okay. So let's do this. Okay, now it looks more realistic. Could I do better? Yeah, this does look definitely better, but if I wanna to go to 10 seconds, I'm gonna to have to pull this down and adjust. Well, yeah, let's do 100 steps. 100 steps at point one. And here's looking pretty accurate, but here's where I have to pull down, right? Yeah. I'm gonna make a point here in a second, so be patient. Okay, now you're looking at this problem and say, yes, this is the solution that bounced off the origin and went to the right. And you see that this point one step is so dense, I'm making course corrections very quickly. In fact, I don't even like all these points making this line fuzzy and thick. So why don't I Look at this, I'm gonna take the markers and turn off the markers. Marker options, none. Okay, so here's a curve and yeah, for sure this looks like that homework problem I did yesterday, or at least one of the solutions. But here's the problem, it's wrong. And this is the issue with numerical approximations. You have to be very careful what you accept. It looks beautiful, but let's tighten this DT. Cut it in half. Uh-oh. If I did more sensitive course corrections, is it actually bouncing off the other way? Now I'm upset. Now I'm nervous. Now, by the way, when I did that course correction, even 100 lines only takes me to five seconds, right? So now here comes the pain. I got to take this down to 200 lines. And I know I could adjust this by looking at the data series, 
Does anybody have the trick for pulling down two of these lines at the same time? Maybe if I option clicked it or something. Nope, that didn't do it. Maybe if I control click, because Microsoft loves control. Nope, that didn't do it. I'm just making a bad Microsoft joke, sorry. Yes, now I'm starting to think about this. Even at 0 0.1, I could be fooled into thinking the real solution was over on the right. And it was actually over here on the left. Now, I did just go to 10 seconds, right? I did go to 10 seconds, but I'm going to crank this down even further because it's worth the demonstration. Let's course correct every one hundredth of a second. Course correcting every one hundredth of a second will require 1,000 lines. So I need to add 800 lines. So I need to go to line 1008. Let's take a quick trip down to line 1008. And you guessed it, that means I got to pull down those data series again. So, sorry. But it just takes a second and it's worth the demo. There's one. And here comes the other. This is the danger with numerical approximations. Now, sometimes numerical approximations produce pure garbage. But when they produce pure garbage, at least you're warned. And you do what? You start to search for the error. But when a numerical approximation produces something that looks good, like this, you don't search for an error. This looks believable. It looks like what Mathematica produced. But I wasn't being sensitive enough with the DTs. So I actually have a wrong answer here. That's closer to the truth. Okay, well, that's a big deal if this was some kind of physical situation where you needed to go left or right, right? Now, I still need you to do this on your fingers and toes on your own Excel spreadsheet. So this is in the video. You can execute and reproduce this. And uh, I've warned you about what could go wrong. At least I've warned you about what could go wrong. But I want you to go physically execute it. Did I need to go to one one hundredth of a second? I don't think so. One fiftieth of a second would have also got me to the truth. You see? But now I've got 20 seconds of one fiftieth of a second. Right, I'm down here at 20 seconds. That's no harm. Here's another issue with numerical things. They require computing time. Even though Excel did this very quickly, actually very quickly. If you were in professional land, Excel is kind of slow. I mean, it's good for doing rough mockups, but it may not be good enough for a real mission critical application. That's why I made fun of the power companies the other day. I mean, even nuclear power plants running control systems in Excel. I know they're being more careful than that.
I know they're more professional than that. But you got to be careful. I mean, don't tell me that that doesn't happen in 2020. It does. So if you want a real professional result, yeah, Excel's just going to give you some clues, but you're going to have to step up to the real software. Okay. So I'm going to put this aside, stop sharing it. And let's go back here. We can squeeze some stuff in here before we do break. So what I wanted to do is do this with you carefully. So you can see this happening. Let's do a mathematic example carefully. So you can see that happening. There, I'm not going to go from scratch. I'm going to go from my pre built sample sheet just so you can see something happening. I'd like to go back to the zombie questions later, maybe in the second half, the SIR model, the infectious disease model 2.7. But let's, let me look at a problem in here in 2.3 or 2.2, some crazy abstract system in 2.2. Let's model it. Now, the problem we just did was based on 2215 alt, but what happens if I just did uh, 2215? Or a 2216? Or a 2217? Yeah, let's look at 2217. 15, 16, 17, they were all about the same. But I'm going to give you this idea. I haven't done problem 17 before. I'm just looking at it. So in this case, it's more like fair. Like I haven't pre-done the problem. I don't know how it's going to work. So it's a little more honest demo. Let's write this, let's set it up, let's put it in Mathematica. Then we're gonna take a short break and come back. And, and here's, yeah, okay, let's, let me write down, then we'll talk. Because I want this to be a real demo. Whether you're here live or watching this later. So dx dt was y and dy dt is minus cosine x minus y. It's not cosine of x minus y, it's minus cos x then minus y. Uh, the instructions here say find equilibrium points do a direction field and a phase portrait. And uh, describe solutions. The describing solutions is where I know if you've internalized this, if you see what they're talking about. Oh, okay. Uh, Thank you for trying that. Uh, the, the comment in the private chat is they were trying to grab both columns too. Somewhere on YouTube, there's a seven-year-old Excel whiz who shows you how to do that. <laughs> grab both of those columns at once. And you can pull up and do the data series at a dialogue window. For those of you who have done more Excel, you might know what that means. But we're not going to do extreme Excel every day. So don't worry about it. We'll find it later. Here's the real secret to using technology. Technology is not going to do squat for you. Technology is not going to do nothing for you. Unless you already know what the answer is. In a way, right? In order for me to 
make a good tech mock-up of this, I have to have a feeling for what's going on or else I'm in deep trouble. So let's let this first one be light blue. Let's let the second one be green. I have to feel what's going on. I have to know when there are equilibrium points, when dx dt is zero and when do y dt is zero. Well, light blue, dx dt is zero is a relatively simple question. It happens when y is zero, which is the x-axis. So on this line, there is no x motion. I do not go left, I do not go right in my field. I only go up or down. Let's try this one. When is dy dt zero? Well, you set this equal to zero. Imagine there's an equal zero on the side. And that would give you y equals negative cos x. Okay, I'm only gonna draw this casually, qualitatively. I know what cosine x looks like. I know what upside down cosine x looks like. Let's run it. I'm not trying to draw accurate. I'm not trying to draw the scale. In fact, I got a little bit sloppy as I went along. But there's a cosine graph that's upside down starting at zero. Now, here's the next question. Equilibrium points. What are equilibrium points? When both of these are zero. From this drawing, I now know when both of these are zero. Where the red crosses the green. My scale is horrible, but because of my knowledge of cosine, I know when that happens. This is zero, this is pi, this is pi over two and so on down the line. This is three pi over two. This is five pi over two. I'm not gonna go too far negative. This is negative pi over two. On this wavy line, there is no Y motion. All the motion is either left or right. And you know what's gonna happen, even compared to the one you already did, that's gonna be very busy in the slope field. That's gonna be a very, very busy slope field, kind of hard to interpret. So I have to have a plan. And my plan is that maybe I should just look at a little bit of this at once. Maybe I should just take even three equilibrium points is too much. Maybe one is too little, but let's check out a window that just kind of swallows three equilibrium points. How high is this window? 10? No, that's ridiculous. The action's happening down here. Cosine's never bigger than one. I think two to minus two would be a good window. What about right here? pi over two, pi over two, 1.57. Here's a pi negative right there. How about minus three to pi, five pi over two, which is 15 over two, roughly, roughly. Let's set that up to six, minus three to six, minus two to two. This is nine units, by the way. This is four units. So I'm planning, right? I can plan and execute on the fly too, but a little bit of planning in the beginning makes is much, much better. Okay, we're gonna crawl up to the break, but at least let me open up a Mathematica notebook and get ready to put in these parameters. Okay, so for the Mathematica notebook, I'm gonna take the one off the website, which is just, uh, la, 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 la. where is it? Down here, 
week two technology first order systems, that raw notebook I gave you, although I did give you other notebooks. But that takes me to a Google Drive. You've probably played with these already. Let's make them by name. So I have a lot of notebooks in here. First order systems is that one. Got to download it. Got to open it. So I'll open it and then share that notebook with you. Just to have you see it. And then we'll take a break. So let's pump up the words. Got it. So this is the Mathematic Notebook on our website. And it's got a system built into it as a demo, right? And I showed you this when we first did this. And all kinds of demo games here, like here's some curves. Here's some field of curves and solutions at the same time. So this notebook is going to do stuff for us, right? Our major problem is now, how do we make it fit our problem? OK, so I'm going to put in the y right there. And I'm going to put in the minus cosine x minus y. All built-in commands in Mathematica must be called capitalized. If you put cosine in there, Mathematica doesn't know what it is. That's why it's blue. Mathematica doesn't know what little c cosine is. If you put curly or round braces around cosine, Mathematica doesn't know what it is. All functions built in or user defined are delimited by square bracket. Now I have this built into the system. I hit shift return and I don't get any feedback because I didn't ask Mathematica to do anything. I just defined variables. But if you want feedback, ask Mathematica, what's f of seven and four? Mathematica will respond, it's four. What about ask Mathematica, what's g of pi and four? Well, pi is cosine minus one, opposite of minus one, give me plus one. I'm a little bit nervous. Am I doing that right? Cosine of pi is minus one. Yeah, I got to know stuff like that. Oh, OK. So minus one plus one subtract four minus three. OK, so we're on the same page. If I don't want to see this stuff anymore, I just grab the cell bar here on the right and hit delete. You can also undo in Mathematica. So. If we needed to undo something we did wrong, we could undo it, just Control Z or Command Z. Okay, I think here, before we start doing stuff and then disconnect, let's take a break and come back to this. And again, not because this is a hard problem, because I wanna see, I want you to show you how to decorate things in a more advanced way in Mathematica. I'm gonna stop that share back to my paper. Let's say back at, uh, what is it, 1059. We'll give you 105. Okay, so stretch your legs. I'm gonna do the same. And then let's see how pretty we can make this in Mathematica.
Okay, we're back and we're going to go back to our Mathematica notebook. And so let's just try to change the parameters in that pre built notebook to get us some kind of picture that might tell us what's happening at these equilibrium points. This is a first order system. This is a field. The solutions are flowing through that field. And the way they flow through the field is dictated by these equilibrium points and by, in a sense, this blue and green line when there's no X motion or no Y motion. Now you could look at the field first and then try to deduce how it's flowing or try to deduce what the important points are. But the reason he said find the equilibrium points first is so that you had some kind of basis to know what you were looking for. So let's go check it out. I will open up the Mathematica notebook again. Okay, you and I are in the same place. So first thing I wanna do is look at some streamlines and field and the streamlines in the field together, like I have here. But I'm gonna remove some decoration. I'm gonna use other decoration and I definitely have to change the window size. I already decided my Y was going to be minus two to two. And my X was going to be minus three to six, which looks a little bit long to me now, but let's try it. Let's not talk about any particular stream points yet. Let's just let Mathematica do it automatically. And by the way, if you just say to Mathematica, stream points, you know, Mathematica tells you all the things that begin S-T-R-E-A. Stream points is one of them. And then Mathematica gives you some choices. Do you want 10 stream points? Of course, fine. Uh, you can do automatic too, but let's see what 10 looks like. <coughs> In the vector field, I have these decorations on my vectors right here. But again, I'm going to cut those out because if you're using the current version of Mathematica, it does a much better job of auto decorating the vectors. So let's try to be very basic. Let's look at this show command. Yes, I want the show to be minus two to two, minus three to six on X, and minus two to two on Y, right? The grid lines in the table, that, that's a, that was a fancy extra decoration. I don't need grid lines right now. If I need them, I'll add them. So there's a basic show command. Show what? Show streamlines and field. Show it where? From minus three to six, from minus two to two. Oh, let's do the field calculation from minus three to six and minus two to two. Notice I assembled the show command by defining a plot to be equal to the word field. So I'm just kind of building an image. Could I look at vector plot all by itself? Yes, I could. Let me put it, see where the cursor is blinking. That's an input line. I could put that input line in there. Just paste vector plot in there. Say, what happens? Vector plot, nothing happens. And here the nothing. In the line above, nothing was because I was defining variables. I use this colon equals delayed set. Here the output is suppressed because of the semicolon. Semicolon in Mathematic at the end of a line executes the line but suppresses the output. Let me take off semicolon. Oh, I got a pretty vector plot. And I even see the shadow of a cosine wave in there, possibly. At y equals zero, I see that motion is only up and down and not at left or right in the x direction. This looks promising. Okay, this looks promising. But I don't want to keep adding things to this. Let me get rid of that thing. 
What I want to do is assemble a picture with a vector plot and with some streamlines with a stream plot. So by putting these three things together, assign a variable, assign a variable, show the two variables, I'm going to see everything together. It's not too bad. Now, by the way, I can blank out any one of them anytime I want. Just take out streamlines, show the field. Yeah, I've already seen that. Take out field and show the streamlines. Notice Mathematica says to you, oh, you had a variable that began with ST a second ago. Do you want that variable? Sure, I do. There's the streamlines for this. This is, seems to be what's happening. A little bit like that other problem we had. In fact, it's very similar to that other problem we had, except probably no motion above two or minus two. The problem we just dealt with 2, 2, 15 alt had equilibrium points going forever up and forever down. But now I can start to do some decorating. How about 20 solutions? How about course solutions? How about fine solutions? Now I see some action going on. How about a thousand solutions? I think that's a little excessive. In fact, Mathematica doesn't want to even draw things that tight. Okay, how about specific solutions? What about the specific solution that goes through zero and two or zero and one? Yes, then I'm going to put braces, braces, and then just put zero comma one. I think that'll do it. So what this is, is a list of points. Outer braces makes a list, inner braces makes a point, zero, one. Okay, now I'm getting some specific information. Now this thing had symmetry, right? So why don't I try zero and minus one? That doesn't give me super symmetry, does it? I guess the symmetry was over here. So zero and one should equate to four and minus one over here. Maybe that would be better. Okay, those look similar. They look a little bit similar. Not the same, but they look a little bit similar. Let's go back to the streamlines say automatic. Now this, you could call this a phase portrait. I think the thing that's missing from this phase portrait is you don't see the names of the equilibrium points. Maybe I could add dots for equilibrium points. And in this picture, remember there are three equilibrium points. Minus pi over two, zero, pi over two zero and five pi over two zero. You don't see a representative sample of solutions. You see too many solutions. So here's what I'm gonna do. I think I just want some solutions and I like the solution that heads straight to zero, zero. It's kind of like a boundary. So let's hunt for this solution that heads straight to zero, zero. So I'll go back to streamlines instead of automatic. Let's go and say uh, one comma one. Oh, that has almost hit the target. It looks like I went into zero and then veered crazily off. That even might be worth keeping. I'm just going to mod it slightly. How about 
uh, 0 0.9 comma 1. Ooh, that veered off to the other side, like the Excel spreadsheet I just gave you, right? How about 0 0.95 comma 1? That looks like that dart hit the mark. So that's a keeper. That's a boundary solution. Let's try one from below. How about two and minus one? Now you think that that's not really a good idea. Yeah, that wasn't bound to be right, but by pulling this two over, how about 2.1? How about 2.2? How about 2.3? I could try to find this boundary solution. So here's what I'm gonna do. I think I'm gonna do some indenting so I can do this 2.1. Nope, 2.2. Oh, that's good. I like those two solutions. So let's go to the next line. What were the other solutions I had a second ago? Zero and one. And uh, four and minus one. Got what I said specifically. Okay, so now I'm building some solutions here. How about something coming in from the bottom? How about minus two and minus one? How about something coming in from the top, like uh, five and one? Copy, paste minus two and minus one, five and one. Okay, now I'm getting some action in here. What did it look like before I did this? Are there any other solutions I should use? I mean, this is probably pretty representative of what's happening in that problem, but are there any other solutions I should use? Well, what I could do is Add to this list and say to Mathematica, give me that automatic view again. Didn't like that, did it? I must have a bad syntax here. Try and cut those out. Nope, didn't like that. So I'm doing some bad syntax here, right? Okay, there are my points, I recovered that. But what if I did this? Let's comment out with parentheses star, and then at the end, star parentheses. So every kind of language you use allows you to write comments. So in Mathematica, it's the star parentheses parentheses star and let's put automatic in here just so i can get back to looking at this now i can say are there any other solutions i should have actually as far as face portrait goes i think those six solutions i had a second ago are good enough to show me everything that's happening in the system I guess it wasn't a super fancy system. But do you see that? I've got all these solutions right here. But so many of them are just repeats of the others. So what I could do is comment out the automatic. Maybe I want to use it again. It's not too hard to type uncomment the list of points. Oops, I just ate a parentheses, I think. Don't do that. And go back to those six. Yeah, this is a nice explanation of what's happening in that problem. The only thing I could do better than this is add some points. And I could do that with a list plot. So let's add some equilibrium points.
Now, Mathematica knows I've defined that word before, so it's trying to help me, which is not what I think is helpful right now. There's a command in Mathematica called list plot. If you didn't know the command called list plot, what you could do is go to the help menu and say plot points. But I could just give a list of points here that I want Mathematica to plot. And the list of points I want it to plot is minus pi over two, capital pi is pi constant in Mathematica, zero. And then zero comma zero. And then pi over two comma zero. So, I will do a, notice if I don't do a semicolon to suppress output, it'll actually draw me a plot structure with three points. That's not what I wanted. So let me suppress output with semicolon and then add this variable to my plot structure. Oh, it's not called equilibriums, it's called but you notice when it says equal, I get all those errors, right? So obviously somebody had a heart attack. But notice equilibriums is in blue. And that's a signal from Mathematica. Mathematica is saying that's not been defined yet. I don't know that word. Let's say equilibrium points. Mathematica said, oh, okay, I know that. It's black. Mathematica has seen that variable. And here it comes. So now I've got equilibrium points at zero, I don't think I wanted zero, zero. You're right, pi over two, five pi over two. See, that was my mistake. So pi over two, but that's what happens when you make mistakes. You, you learn that you have to make an adjustment. So now I've got these three equilibrium points. Five pi over two should be visible, shouldn't it? Or should it be first three pi over two? That's back, that's an error in my original planning. Okay, but now I know it. Can I color these red? You look up the command. How do you color a point? Let's say plot style equals red. Notice the little X right here. Mathematica says you didn't separate this with a comma. Okay, now I've got red points to be equilibrium points. I could make them larger or smaller too, but I'm not gonna go that far right now. Okay, I wanna get on to some other things, but let's try ND solve here. And let's see if I can get something to plot one of these solutions. How about the solution that went through zero and one? Let's feed the initial condition zero and one here. So what I did here in this command called ND solve was describe the differential equation and the initial conditions. That's from here to here. X prime is F of X of T, Y of T, Y prime G of X of T, Y of T. I have to use all the variables that define the differential equation. So I have to use X, Y, and T. So Mathematica knows what the names of the variables are. Then x of zero is zero, y of zero is zero. And I have to tell Mathematica what I want it to put out. So I want it to put out a sample solution based on the x of t and y of t functions above. And I have to tell Mathematica where to build the approximation. How many minutes or seconds do I want to go? I'll say from zero second to one second although I don't think that's very illustrative. Mathematica starts spitting error messages at me. Negative uh, 0 0.29 lies outside the range of data, blah, 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 blah. Yes, I changed this from zero to one, but I didn't change this from zero to one. So Mathematica was getting conflicting instructions. Okay. I've got some sample solution from zero to one. 
I'd like more. I don't need this minus five to five stuff apparently. So let's run this from uh, minus one to one. Or minus one to one point two five. Uh, what did I do? I must have destroyed something. Oh, that apostrophe doesn't belong there. Good. Now let's let Mathematica, since I know I've got some work going on here, let's let Mathematica give me some five seconds of this. I have to change the five here too. Well, that's interesting. It's going down to minus one there. So one curve is stabilizing at zero minus one. So I think I need to expand my thinking here. Let's go minus two to two for vertical axis like was in my previous picture. Okay, good. This is taking a long time. I think I have to expand my picture. Let's do 10 seconds approximation. Okay, now I've got the x of t and y of t coordinates stabilizing at what? Zero and this looks like about 1.5-ish. I gotta go back up here to my drawing. No, it's not 1.5-ish. It's 1.57-ish. It's in pi over two units. The x the y is stabilizing at zero, the x is stabilizing at pi over two, 1.57. Okay, now I know that this stuff matches my thinking. Uh, if I wanted to do tick marks in terms of pi, there's a command called ticks. And I could do ticks on the y-axis of fractions of pi, right? So I could do minus pi comma zero, comma pi and it didn't do anything. Um, I might have to go read up on what the ticks specification is. Uh, how about doing the x-axis ones, maybe it wants the x-axis ones too, zero comma two comma four comma six comma eight comma ten. Okay. We are not succeeding here. Just to show you how to fix this, let's stop sharing this because I've spent too much time on this problem anyway. Let's share whole screen and tell you what I mean by looking at the help menu. So you got my whole screen in front of you now. Mathematica, Wolfram documentation, I want to plot tick marks. I've heard of this command called ticks, but I don't know how to use it. Okay, Mathematica says, here's how you use the ticks command. Ticks none, ticks automatic. Ticks in terms of pi, this looks like something I'd want to do. Frankly, it looks like I did it that way. You know, ticks pi over two, it looks like I had done it that way. So let me go back to my worksheet. Oh, now I know what I did. The pies were on the horizontal axis and the vertical axis was still zero ones and twos. So I need to reverse these, don't I? So sooner or later, you figure out what you're doing right and wrong. Okay, let's try that. Pi over two, pi over two. Let's do pi and let's do three pi over two. And I definitely don't need zero to 10 on the y-axis. Now that I got a straight minus two, comma minus one, comma zero, comma one, comma two. There's other ways to do this automatically. Now I feel better. Uh, something still looks wrong to me. No, no, that was right. 
This is the X of T and Y of T graphs. Yeah, so the problem is I wanna see that pi over two right here on this black line. So I do want to see that on the Y axis. So copy. And the problem is the X axis scale and the Y axis scale are gonna be different values, aren't they? So this is not too illustrative. Here, here's my minus pi over two on the X axis, on the Y axis, excuse me. And here's my X of T zooming in on minus pi over two. But the Y wasn't using the pi over two units. I mean, I, it could, but it was using, it was zeroing on zero. Okay, so maybe this whole ticks experiment was a bad idea. Yeah, but that's the way you practice. Okay, I don't think, here I was trying to do them side by side and I was illustrating doing them side by side by building the streamlines, the field, the numerical solution, and then showing them together individual solutions in here. I'll say this word right here with this slash dot slash dot notation. So you basically should follow my format when you do that. Solution was the numerical solution that Mathematica created. But now I wanna tell Mathematica to plot that. So I have to say to Mathematica, take the output of the solution variable above and feed it to the X of T and Y of T graphs. So this slash dot is called replace all. It takes the information from the solution variable and replaces it in the X of T and Y of T graphs. That's how I created this. The reason why is I don't know the formula for these X of T and Y of T graphs, right? If I just ran this numerical solver by itself, look at the output. This is the output of the nd solve command. Mathematica reports to me that it created a numerical solution and it looks about like this, but it does not have a formula for them. The top one is in blue. I didn't do any negative numbers over here. The bottom one is in black. Yes, I didn't do any negative numbers on here. So Mathematica has numerical data for me. I could expand and get more information about that numerical data. What method did it use? Not the Euler's method, by the way. So there's other approximations to the Euler's method. We didn't use those, we're not gonna use those. Okay, so here is a small example of Mathematica, not too exciting. I guess I wanted some more excitement than this, but that's the way it is right now. I guess I was trying to communicate to you, you're gonna to need to dig into Mathematica, you're gonna to need to make errors, you're gonna to need to send me the errors. I guess that's the message I was trying to communicate. Okay, good. If you have issue running Mathematica on your own computer, then you might need to talk to me separately. I don't think I could arrange for a free Mathematica online account, but I know that there are, you can go to Mathematica and type Mathematica online and the student can use it for free for a month for $9. Well, not use it for free for $9, use it for a month for $9. But, and you can use other programs as I put into the syllabus. Nobody's reported using that slopes program to me yet, but somebody brought that to me before the class saying, oh, would this work? And I said, I don't know, I'll have people test it. So you could try that also, but this offers you, Mathematic offers you fine control. Okay, stop sharing, back to paper.
we're going to do more detailed analysis of systems like this later in chapters three and five. Chapter three, some simpler ones that are fundamental. Chapter five, some fancier ones than this. Okay, let's go back to our problem list and see what we got here. So we did a sample mathematically, we did a sample of Excel. That's what I think some people needed today. Maybe we should look at the infectious disease problem with some time that we have remaining. Let's look at section 2.7. Let's look at the infectious disease model. Let's play around in Mathematica and see what we can get. And then I'll show you some results. And remember 2.76 is a problem whose solution is posted. So you could actually read that. Okay, so let me pull up the book on my screen in case I wanna to refer to a problem on the screen. And then I'll share it to you when. I wanna read the problem on the screen. So section chapter two, section seven, got it. Uh, let me move that out of my way. Cause the windows get too busy. Close that. Close that, good. So let's go and show you where I'm gonna grab this Mathematica notebook. So back to our website. Find the website, there it is. No, I'm sharing the wrong browser. Let's try again. Where's my Microsoft Edge browser? There it is. Okay, you see it, I see it, good. So I posted a mathematic notebook here called SIR model and discrete SIR model. Discrete SIR model is an extra, don't worry about that right now. If you wanna play with these further, then you can look at that. And you are learning about differential equations Maybe another day you'll learn about difference equations, not in my class, maybe an advanced engineering mathematics class. But if you just wanna see another way to do these things, I was doing some experiment here for you. Let's download the SIR model notebook. And let us, I'm gonna use a copy on my own desktop so I don't spend time downloading it. And then I'm going to share this with you. So stop the screen share there. Share Mathematica notebook. Okay, so you can use this on your problem number eight, but let's use it in a basic SIR model. This is set up to be the basic model where I'm using X for susceptibles and Y for infected. So what you see is when susceptibles and, and infected interact, it detracts from the susceptibles and it adds to the infected. But here the infected are getting better at a certain rate, like one tenth of the time units. If I'm measuring time units in days, then to say one tenth of them get better every day is essentially saying that this sickness, whatever it is, lasts 10 days. Because every 10 days, a batch of them will get better. So that's what that one tenth represents. The 0 0.2 represents how communicable this disease is, how easily 
is it passed? If this number is small, then not a lot of susceptible people become infected. So remember this was alpha, this is 0.2, beta was the 0.1. Those are the letters that used. So I define those variables and then let's look at a plot. Now I've got a stream function here, but I've also got a slope field here. So I did streamlines and field as I did before. Let's just look at the streamlines. I'll suppress the field for a second. So what I did is I started a solution at 0 0.9 and 0 0.1. That means 90% of the people are susceptible and 10% of the people are infected. So no recovered zero. What happens? Susceptible is the horizontal axis. Infected is the vertical axis. Look at this, infected starts to rise. Infections start to rise. Susceptible start to fall. So by this point, I get susceptibles at 0.4 and infecteds at 0.2. Where's the other 0.4? Well, they must be recovered. So as this curve flows, the susceptibles decrease because the infecteds increase, but then also as this curve goes along, the recovereds, the recovereds increase. And if I change the parameters, let's make the infection happen easier. Let's make this 0.3. What does that do? It means the infections raise higher. The infections increase faster. The susceptibles decrease to a smaller number. Let's make the recovery time slower. Now it takes 20 days to recover. So infected people hang out for a long time. Let me put back the field. But you noticed in any one of those parameters I did, the field kind of looked like this, kind of rising, falling, rising, falling, and going down to near zero. What does that represent? I'll put back the original numbers. That represents that as the infection is introduced into the population, naturally infections are gonna rise depending on where you start the experiment. We started way down here at 0.9 susceptibles, 0.1 infected. If I would have started at 0.5 susceptibles, 0.5 infected, what would that look like? That's starting about right here. That's already well into the pandemic or the epidemic. And pretty quickly, susceptible rate is falling and infected rate is falling. So what do you see in this horizontal portion of this field? What you see is the turnaround between infections rising and infections falling. And remember this vertical axis is I, infecteds. So what happens when the infecteds rate of growth is zero? Well, that's a horizontal patch. So when the infecteds rate of growth is zero, that means the infection, the pandemic is easing. The infection rate is dropping. Less people are becoming infected. You're past the bad point. But again, that bad point could be many places, depending on how communicable this is. Here, that bad point is not until I've infected 35% of the population, or sorry, 65% of the population. I only have 35% susceptibles left. 
Let's look at some individual curves of susceptibles and infected. And by the way, to do this problem for number eight, you're going to likely have to modify these equations here. You're not going to get the same slope fields I'm producing here. Okay, let's go back to the point nine and point one. It's kind of tedious to change these one at a time, but I didn't automate it more than that. Let's look at solution curves of susceptibles and infected individually. So I'll go back to ND solve. And here I got 0 0.9 and 0 0.1. There is a curve, black must be what? 0 0.9 susceptibles. Blue must be infected. This is a curve you might have seen on television a couple times. As the susceptibles decrease, we hit this peak infection rate at about 20%, 20 days into the epidemic. I am not talking about COVID-19 right now, I'm just talking about in general. But if I had had a faster infection rate, let's run this. Oh, look at that. Susceptibles get eaten up very quickly and infected rise very fast. Let's make this thing more communicable. And let's make it harder to recover from. Yes, this is what, this looks more like COVID-19. Although again, I'm not modeling COVID-19, but I'm peaking with 60% of the population infected, or a little bit more. The susceptibles being eaten up, totally eaten up. Let me go back to the original numbers with a no peak or with a not exotic peak. Notice something interesting about the susceptibles. This infection, which doesn't spread very fast, do you see the susceptibles never go to zero? What do you have if you have an infection that doesn't spread very fast? If you have an infection that doesn't spread very fast, then what do you have? You have some members of the population that what? Never get sick. Now here I put in a short recovery time and a small infection rate. I'll go back up to the top. I'll pump up the infection rate and I'll make the recovery time longer. Watch what happens to the susceptibles in black. The susceptibles, a lot of diseases communicated, got a lot of hospital beds filled, very few susceptibles in here. I think what you're saying is, can I model the recoveries in here as well? I hadn't thought about that directly. Let me see if I can add a curve for the recoveries. I'm not optimistic about that because I don't do things well on the fly. But let's try it. One minus x of t minus y of t. And that I want to feed that solution data. Let's see if that does the trick. Oh, I like it. And I want another color. So I've already used black and blue. I'll keep that the same, but let's use red for recovered. Good. This is a curve you may have seen in a Time Magazine on a TV interview with the epidemiologist. Here I'm displaying the susceptibles being eaten up by the infection, the infection peaking and after the infection peaks, a lot of the population gets exposed and recovered. So these population, hopefully in that case, it's immune. But let's go back to a mellow infection rate and do the three curves. 
notice the susceptibles, there's still a small part of the population that never got sick. That black susceptible curve does not go down to zero. So in most infections, this is the case. There are some people that never get sick, right? They just didn't bounce into a uh, infected person. But that's because the infection lasted a long time. Let me shorten the time of the infection. Let's let them recover faster. Watch what happens to the susceptibles when I shortened the recovery time. What should happen to the susceptibles? If I shorten the recovery time, people should recover faster and less susceptibles will bump into infected people. So this black curve is gonna rise. This red curve is gonna shift left. This blue curve is gonna shift down. That's how we feel about it. That's what happened. Notice a full 20% of the population with those parameters never got infected. Let me see if I can put them together in one drawing. That's what the purpose of this was. There's those two things together in one drawing. The field, notice the place of peak infection. The book points out to you that that's when you're looking at beta over alpha. So the ratio of beta to alpha is important. Here the ratio of beta to alpha is one third. And that's about where you turn the corner in the infection. So that's where you want to be. Problem six, and let me run problem six solution by you. So you're going to want to use this Mathematica notebook to try to do problem eight, but you are going to have to modify the F and G here, and you're going to have to experiment. Let me open up the solution to problem six, because problem six in here says, and this is posted online, so I just want to show you something in the solution. Problem six says, what happens if you can re-catch the sickness? Yes. Problem three says, what happens if you vaccinate? Problem six says, what happens if you can re-catch the illness? Let me open this up, just make one comment, and then we'll have to call it a day. So I'll stop sharing that. I'll share solution 276. Solution 276, let me find it. Got it, open it. Share it. Okay, let me make it more readable for you. Okay, that's a little bit readable. I wrote this one by hand, but I included some graphics. So what happens if you modify the model so that you can get sick again? That might be more like the common cold, flu. You know, cold, you get sick with another strain. Of course, COVID, you can get sick with another strain too. Same thing with flu. So once you get the one flu strain, then you're covered. Once you get that one cold virus, you're covered for that virus, but the cold virus mutates, the flu virus mutates, the COVID virus mutated. So we're gonna detract from the recovered people. A certain percentage of recovered people become sick again. I have to do a variable switch here and find new equilibrium points. That's kind of mathematical algebra work. But what does it look like in the images? What does that look like to you? Well, I'll give you a second to think about it, even though I've written it down on the paper below. See, what happens is people are becoming infected. Infection rate rises, but we pass the peak of infection, so infection rate falls. I'm not showing the recovered, it's just the susceptibles infected. But as I round the corner and people recover, in this model, that doesn't end the story. They become susceptible again. 
susceptibles rise and the infection continues on again. Now it probably cycles and stabilizes. And what does it mean to stabilize? This means that if recovered can become susceptible and infected again, that that disease what? Will always be present. You know, if it's something you catch once and you recover and it's no more, well then I guess we're not too worried about it, right? But if people can catch it again, or if it mutates, then what I have here is 10% of the population always carrying that disease. And at least half the population, or basically half the population, always being susceptible. Here I played with the parameters a little bit to see if you could raise the part of the population that was always carrying the disease. It would have been nice for me to graph the individual S, I, and R graphs here, but that's true. So notice each time the SI curve crosses the line beta over alpha, this means that at those moments, the I population, the infected population is at a local max or min. So this graph would go, infecteds would wave up and down forever. Susceptibles would wave up and down forever until they zero in on that equilibrium point. So I'm showing you this picture because this is one way to mod the model. I could type this into Mathematica. In the problem number eight, they want you to mod the model a different way and they give you the equations. You can enter those equations into Mathematica, but you're gonna to have to generate your own images and they're not gonna look like the first one and they're not gonna look like this one. The answer to problem eight is not obvious. So I want to just open that up so that you read the problem correctly. Two, seven, eight. And share. No, that's not two, seven, eight, that's two, five, eight. Okay, come on. Here we go, 278 and share. Okay, so what happens if we translate to the zombie model and we say, yes, people are being turned into zombies. That is an infection, but also people are actively trying to get rid of zombies. So something is taking away from the zombie population. So what we're looking at here is World War Z. We're looking at The Walking Dead, kind of. And the question is, can you find that equilibrium points in this model? Is there any stability in this model? And if there's any stability, is it good for the humans? Is it good for the susceptibles? Do the susceptibles have a chance of winning? What does winning look like in this world? So you can input these equations into Mathematica. You can use some sample parameters like 0.3 and 0.1. Instead of Greek letters alpha and gamma, you could just use 0.3 and 0.1 directly or English letters, whatever. I, I don't want to show you how to type Greek letters in Mathematica right now. But with some basic parameters, is there any hope that the humans can survive? And if so, what is that hope? What conditions would be present that would allow the humans to survive? It's a, it's, it sounds a little bit vague, but play with the image and see what you can do. If you're having trouble creating the image, send me the notebook. 
I'll comment on how you could create the image. Okay, I got to stop share. I got to really wind up the class here. But remember, I gave you information about the exam. I showed you the instructions for the exam and I explained what they were. Uh, they're restrictive, they're very restrictive, and it's not to penalize you. That's to ensure the transfer, transferability of your grade. But always the standing offer, if you have a question, just ask. And you need to send me your Mathematica notebooks or Excel spreadsheets when you're encountering problems. Then we did a couple of examples and mostly we were on screen time and not on paper time today. Okay, I will stop the recording and hang out here for just for a second in case you wanna ask a question personally. <laughs>